Using science stations in the classroom creates opportunities for students to practice the material that you've taught. It also gives you the freedom to monitor their learning and to work with a small group of students. So how do you use science stations in the classroom effectively? Well, aloha and hello. I am Fleur, the face behind Aloha Monday Teaching, and I help middle school science teachers like you and me be more intentional, um, prepared, and refreshed. So we look forward to Monday and um, any day. So we're our best selves for our students. Um, today we're talking all about science stations in the classroom. I love using stations in the classroom. It gives students a variety of things to do, um, to practice what I'm teaching them, and it gives me a chance to walk around and monitor and work with different students. So this is something I do quite often in my classroom. Um, so today's video, this is based on um, this blog post and anything that I mentioned or related to this topic is linked below in the description. So today we're going to talk about um, the benefits of using science stations in your classroom, some ideas for stations, uh, planning and preparing stations, and managing stations. That's probably the biggest one is managing them um, because kids are all over the place. So why use science stations? Um, this offers students that deliberate and repeated practice, and it can be used during any science unit. Um, deliberate and repeated practice is based on neuroscience. The students and people need this to make those neural connections in their brains, and with enough of it, um, it can be put into long-term memory, which is the goal of learning, right? We want students to learn and retain the information. Um, students can work alone or they can work together. It's really their choice during stations. And, you know, you have your kids who like to be alone and work by themselves, and that's totally fine. You have others that want to work together, which is totally fine, too. So Stations gives them that opportunity to do that. Stations also um, offers a variety of activities for different learning styles. So that's up to um, us as teachers to offer these different, um, these kinds of activities for our students. And the last benefit, or not last, I'm sure there's more, but that I'll talk about, that I'm talking about today is that you can monitor your students. Um, this is, this offers you that freedom to really walk around and see uh, what your students are learning, um, addressing any misconceptions, and um, just really working with your students and helping them. So, some um, science stations, here's, we're gonna go over some ideas for science stations. These are stations I include in my um, classroom each time. I have a vocabulary station, a reading station, computer station, and make a model station, which um, my vocab station, they're always practicing their vocabulary words. You can see it pictured here, they match um, vocabulary words with definitions, and then they have to fill out a vocabulary frame. Um, I also have to check their cards first to make sure they didn't mix any up. In the reading station, I usually have some kind of reading passage there with some questions for them to answer. It could also be from their textbook. Um, computer station, we have our resource that we use um, has a lot of computer interactivities, and so we'll put one or two interactivities in a computer station. We've used BrainPop there, or even like review using Quizlet or GimKit, BlueKit, that kind of thing. For Make a Model Station, they are either making something 3D or they're drawing, like making a diagram illustrating a concept. So those are things that I usually um, have in every unit when I do stations. Here are some other stations that you can do in addition to those. So math and science station is, it could include graphing. I like to make sure my students are graphing. That seems to be a difficult concept to do, and it's an important one. They have to analyze all this data. So I like to include graphs. 
Um, or you can even do formulas depending on what you're teaching in science. There's a lot of um, science that have math formulas. Experiment, they can do some kind of small lab or experiment. A sorting station where they sort out concepts, like I've done this with layers of the atmosphere, they sort out the descriptions into each layer, uh, um, that kind of stuff. Let's see, task card station. They're just looking at different task cards, answering the questions. A writing station, claim evidence reasoning could be in there. A game station, that could be interesting. Maybe put some task cards in with a board game and that's a game station. Uh, maybe they create their own game. So it's really up to you what you wanna offer. Um, what you see pictured here are some science station signs that I've made. Um, those are linked below. And the vocabulary one is free, just so you can check it out. But these are the directions for your stations. I like to have them do something first. So I'll have what they need to do, one or two activities that they have to complete. And then I have a part that says then, where it gives them options if they still have time at their station to complete um, some other activities. All right, so when you are planning, so now that you've got some ideas in mind, um, let's talk about planning your station. So the first thing you need to think about is if this activity is going to help your student master the standards or um, and the objectives that you are covering. You also want to think if think about um, whether your students can complete this independently or with little support. You don't want it to be something too difficult for them to do because they are going to have a time frame to complete these. Is this activity engaging and have I considered different learning styles? So you want to make sure this is where you think about that. Like, you know, do you have something for your um, kinesthetic learners or your, you know, visual learners? And can this be completed in less than 15 minutes? Usually when I do stations, I do 12 or 13 minutes plus with time. Time goes by really fast in class when you're doing stations and then you realize you don't necessarily have 15 minutes. So I would plan for activities that can be done in 15 minutes or less because then you have those extensions afterwards in case they do finish. Or if you set it at 20 minutes, then they're completing what you want them to do plus working on something extra. Uh, so think about those things when you're planning your stations and choosing those activities. Um, then you're preparing them. So I like to use these IKEA um, Trofast tubs. They're perfect for storing materials. I use them when I'm preparing for anything. Like they store my lab materials, my stations, everything. Uh, so this is, and I even use them in my stations, holding papers and directions, all of that stuff. So you gather your materials, put them in tubs, put them in a certain area. This will help you save time and then decide where you're going to put them. When you set up your station, I like to use those acrylic um, document holders for my directions. Plus they know where the station is, like it's standing. They, there's no reason you can't find the directions. Um, and I use different kinds of containers and tubs to hold things like you see the paper tray there holding vocabulary frames. I've got those little three compartment um, tubs to hold different activities. So use what you have in your classroom. Um, for storage, to place the materials so your students have access to them, and make sure your directions are posted. All right, so let's talk about grouping your students. So this goes, um, this starts to go with the management piece. This is, um, I know we all have different class sizes, and I've asked questions before in different like Facebook groups, and I'm surprised I thought it was normal to have, I thought large classes meant what I have, like, I guess it is what I have. I have classes of 36, and I thought that was normal everywhere, but apparently it's not, we're not really the norm. So this is what we, this is how we group students. So this will help you even if you have 24 students, which is like the dream number, right? Um, so you can divide your class, especially if it's a large class. You want your groups to be small like three or four kids at a station at a time if possible. Make duplicate stations so you have a small group at each station. And what I do with that, I divide my classroom in half. So at stations one through four, I have a group of students rotating there. And at stations five through eight, I have the duplicate station set up 
and I have another group of students rotating there. And that way the groups are smaller. And when you're grouping your students, you can use different types of grouping strategies. You can use the lab groups they're already in. You can level your groups based on academics. You can randomly group them, totally up to you. They can choose if they want, right? Okay, so I wanna go over a few examples of dividing up your class or you know setting up your groups. So this is for a class of 36 students. So just imagine, okay, you got 36 kids. If I have four stations set up, um, I could duplicate each station and set them up on different sides of the room. So I have two sets of stations. That means I have eight altogether. So that is going to leave um, like four, four to five kids in each group. Okay, so they're on opposite sides of the room and they're working on their stations. Another example is the same thing. So 36 kids, I have four stations that they're working through and I'll make three sets of each. So now I have 12 stations set up all over my room and that just creates smaller groups, which I prefer. Now, this is typically what I do, especially with my larger classes of the 36, because it, um, it makes it more manageable. So what I do is I divide my class in half. So 18 students are gonna spend one class period at the computer station. The other 18 students are going through stations and I've already duplicated my station. So I have like two copies of it. So I have small groups rotating through. Then the next day I switch them. So the kids that were on the computer station are now rotating through those stations that are set up. And the kids who did the stations yesterday are now on the computer station. And that has been the, the best way for my larger classes. Um, another piece of managing your stations is having visuals for different things. So you, if you're, so you may offer your students the choice to rotate at their own pace, which is fine. Um, I do that with some of my classes. Some of my other classes that require more management, I rotate them through. So I set a timer and I use a visual that tells them what station that they are supposed to be at. And that helps me too, because then I can quickly look at the screen and see where the kids are. And if they're not where they're supposed to be, then I can redirect them. Um, so you want to have a visual of that, whether it's showing them where they're supposed to be, maybe the order of the stations they should be going in. Um, you'll want a timer on there to see how much time they have either at that station or in class. Another visual is to show the directions at each station. So here's those station signs I talked about earlier. Um, it shows them what they do first and then what they do if they finish that activity and there's still time. So you want to make sure your um, directions are also very clear so students don't have a lot of questions and you're able to monitor. All right, finally, we're going to talk about your role in um, when your students are working on stations. So your role is to monitor your students and help them. So you should be walking around the room. These kids will be raising their hand. They'll be coming up to you. It's nonstop. Um, <laughs> trust me, it's especially in those big classes. It's nonstop. And Mrs. Strongholy, Mrs. Strongholy. So I'm all over the place. I get my steps in during stations. And so you're, that's your job is to monitor them, make sure they're on task, redirect when needed, help them, work with them. You can work with a small group. So let's say you have a group of kids at your make a model station and you see that they're struggling. Work with that group at that time. Um, another thing is you can make yourself a station. If your students have like shown, you know, that they can handle stations. If you're with a group, say you're the vocabulary station, because that's a big thing, right? Then you're working with that group of students on vocab while the other students are doing their job at their station. So you'll want to make sure that you've taught them all of those expectations in order for you to be at a station because you're not able to walk around and monitor when you're working with a group of kids. So that's an idea when um, you feel that your class is ready for it. All right, we talked about a lot of stuff about stations. Um, we talked about different kinds of activities you can do at stations, why stations work in the science classroom, um, how to plan, how to prep your materials, what you need to manage and group your students and what kind of visuals, and then your job when it's station stays. Um, one thing I didn't mention 
was the time that you need for stations. We've talked about the timer, like 12 to 15 minutes. We talked about that. But how many days do students need to work on stations? I would give them at least two or three days. That way they can complete the stations effectively. Okay, so it's your turn. Have you implemented science stations in your classroom yet? Um, what stations do you like to have? And if you haven't or you saw something new, what will you try? And in the meantime, go ahead and check out some other videos I have about different activities you can do in your science classroom, um, classroom management, lesson planning, and all that. And I will see you next time. Thank you.